Now, when I was 10 years old, my dad woke me up. It was around my birthday. And he asked me if I wanted to go with him to Milwaukee. Now, Milwaukee uh, was about three hours away from where I was living in Chicago. And he said that he was preaching at a conference. And if I went with him to Milwaukee, he would buy me a pack of basketball cards. I did the math, six hours of driving, a few hours of listening to my dad preach for a $2 pack of cards, no brainer. So I get in the car, I'm with my dad and we're on our way to Milwaukee. I show up there and I find out we're not at a Bible conference at all. We're at the Los Angeles Laker Milwaukee Bucks game. I'm pumped out of my mind. If you know anything about me, I'm just psyched. I'm, wa- I'm walking around. Now, after the game, my dad says, hey, Johnny, we got to take a unique way to get to the parking lot. This exit is closed. And I'm just, okay, dad, you know, whatever. I'll do it, anything you want now. And he takes me into the Laker locker room. And I'm just losing it, you know, like I meet Shaq and Kobe and Shaq's feet are size 22. And dad's like, hey, Johnny, say hello to Shaquille O'Neal. And I'm just, I couldn't believe his feet. They're as big as the podium. And I mean, if you know me, I mean, everybody. And uh, I I mean, uh, happy tears. You know, I'm not a crier, but this might have been the closest I've come. This was a tremendous gift. Uh, I'll never forget A, a gift that... My dad was so kind to give, but the gift that was the greatest gift my dad ever gave me wasn't the Laker game, it wasn't an event. The greatest gift my dad ever gave to me was a lesson learned over time. That being a biblical work ethic. My dad was and is a hard worker and he taught his boys and his girls to be hard workers as well. As I consider the theme, it would be a massive miss to consider how we live our life in a dark and polluted world to not approach the biblical theme of work. You guys are going to spend half of your waking hours over the next 40 years in the workplace. And so in order for us to honor God effectively and to shine brightly in a world of darkness, you need to know what the Bible says about work. We live in a country that is progressing towards socialism, but this of course is not how our country was founded. Our country was founded upon something that was known as the Protestant work ethic, a work ethic that was grounded in biblical convictions. The earliest settlers of our country were known not only for their religious fervor, but they were known for their diligent labor. They were known for being hard workers. Culturally, and even amongst many professing Christians, this high view of work, grounded in biblical convictions, has been largely abandoned today. Furthermore, and this is part of the impetus for why I even want to talk about this, there seems to be today in Christian circles an overemphasis on the subjects of rest and Sabbath at the expense of providing a biblical worldview of work. I hear hear a number of people, millennials and Gen Zers, that will come up to me and ask me if I've read the latest book on rest and Sabbath and shalom. But I've never heard a young person, my age included, come up to me recently and said, Johnny, have you read that book lately on how dignified, noble, God-honoring and enjoyable work is? Now, to be fair, many people today find themselves in opposite gutters along the highway of work. Many people are in the gutter of laziness, idleness, and a lack of discipline. And in the other gutter on the other side of the highway would be workaholism, where money, success, and notoriety become our idol. Some people spend their life chasing meeting after meeting to make more money and shift after shift. And other people spend their life binging show after show and scrolling through reel after reel on their phone. Side note in this regard, the average person in this room scrolls their smartphone or peruses Netflix, Prime, or Disney Plus a total of seven hours a day. That's over 2,500 hours a year, which means that over the next four years, you will spend one year looking like this or like this. 
life-changing channels. The average U.S. life expectancy is 78 years old, and the average person in our country will spend 15 of those years staring at a screen on their phone or on the television. There is indeed a reality where we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. And a phone-saturated, television-binging Christian world will never turn, the gospel, never turn the world upside down with the gospel. Many people in this room likely want to change the world for Christ, but few have the self-control to get off Instagram and do something. Now back to work, literally in this sense. We need to view our work to be aligned with God's word and God's way. And at times I believe we are now living in an environment, even amongst Christians, where there is an allergic reaction to discipline. This morning I want to provide you with a biblical theology of work. And if you are to live for Christ faithfully while you are here on earth, you must have a biblical framework for what in many ways God has made you to do. I want to look at this theme and cover four main areas with our time this morning. Four main areas regarding the subject and theme of work. And I hope this is helpful to you. Number one, I want to look at works designer, if you're taking notes. Works designer. Now, Dallas Willard was a Christian philosopher whose writings are shaping many young adults today through the continued writing of his disciples. John Ortberg and John Mark Comer would say that he is their spiritual mentor. Now, Dallas Willard, and I'm not knocking on everything they've said, but Dallas Willard was once asked, if you had to describe the life of Jesus in one word, what word would you use to describe the life and ministry of Jesus? Now think of all the words that you would use to describe what Jesus' life was like in one word. But Dallas Willard responded with the word relaxed. He uses the example of Jesus' interruptibility and unhurried life, that he was walking through life three miles an hour and he could easily be interrupted. And he uses that interruptibility of Jesus as this framework for a theme that Jesus' life and ministry could be described by one word, that being relaxed. There is indeed a very real element of the tenderness and compassion of Jesus But the word relax to describe the ministry of Jesus provides connotations that are difficult to reconcile with the Jesus of the Bible. Now, I love the Gospel of Mark. Now, there is a specific word used in Mark's Gospel that is used 41 times. It's used 51 times in the New Testament totally, but 41 times this word is used in the Gospel of Mark. You know what that word is? Immediately, immediately. This word also could be translated right away, and there's a significance to it. Mark wants you to understand something about Jesus. Jesus wasn't waltzing during his time on earth. He was working. He was on a mission, and he was under a divine timetable. Jesus says in John 9, verse 4, I must work the works of my Father. In John 4, 34, he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Whatever it is that God does, Jesus does. In fact, Jesus will say this in John 5, 17. He says, my father is working still and I am working. And the Jews went nuts because Jesus was making himself equal with God and because he says he does the work of God. Now, when we talk about work, we need to understand, you need to understand fundamentally that the God who made you is a worker. Jesus was a teacher for three years, but he was a carpenter for 20. His hands were not soft. They were calloused. They were splintered. And they were hardened by labor. Jesus, in whom all the fullness of deity dwells, represents to us that God is not relaxed. God is a worker. Now, How does God work? Well, God the Father worked when he created all things for his glory. He works right now, it says in Hebrews 1, in the Son, as he sustains and upholds the universe by the word of his power. God is working right now as he is channeling the hearts of kings and kingdoms according to his providential plan for his glory and our good. He's working right now as he's answering prayer. 
He's working in redemption. The son is working right now. He was working in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. He was with the father. He works in his incarnation as a carpenter. He works in his ministry as a teacher and a healer. Right now he is working because John 14 says that right now he is preparing a place for you in glory. Your God is not on a hammock. He's a working God. The Spirit is working as He hovers over all things. The Spirit works right now as He takes hardened hearts and transforms them into hearts of flesh. The Spirit works as He illumines your mind to understand the content of Scripture. The Spirit works right now as He is interceding on your behalf with groanings too deep for words. God is a working God. And you do not understand the nature of God until you understand that He is working. Not in the sense where he is expending energy because God is spirit, but in the sense where he is upholding, sustaining, answering prayers, orchestrating nations, kings, and individuals to accomplish his perfect plan. God is not relaxed. God is working. So number one, that's works designer. God is a working God. Now secondly, I want to look with you at works design. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look at Genesis 1 with me for a moment. If you don't know where that is, just look at page one. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want to set the scene for you. God makes an Edenic state. It's perfect. He says it, it's beautiful there. I don't know what you imagine when you imagine the Garden of Eden. As a kid, I always imagined the, the jungle and Lion King with the waterfalls and the Hakuna Matata. You know, I mean, it's got to be beautiful. But God made the garden and he placed man in it. And it wasn't just Tov. It wasn't just good. It was Tov Ma'ov. It was very, very good. And before the fruit and before the serpent and before Cain crushed Abel with the leg of a table as my grandpa used to say God put Adam and Eve in the garden to work he says be fruitful and multiply then watch this then every successive imperative in Genesis 1:28 is going to flow out of their command to populate the earth what's a word you see over and over again right here well it's the word over He says, God says, verse 28, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the, the birds of the sky and over every living thing. Back to verse 26, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps. What a cool first job description. What do you do for a living? I rule the earth. You know, it's not a bad gig. And God is saying, your first job is to rule over everything, to subdue it, to cultivate the ground, it'll say in Genesis 2. God assigns work before the fall and original sin. And this mandate to work hard has never been withdrawn, so it need never be repeated. This is God's will for our life. In a perfect garden void of sin, God places them there and says, be fruitful and multiply because the only way you can subdue the earth is if you have more help. Work is a good thing given by a good God. Therefore, idleness and laziness is sinful and ungodly and labor itself is godly and noble. Labor is part of the, labor is part of the dignity that we have as image bearers of God. Only men can write symphonies and shoot movies. Only men and women can make the Eiffel Tower. Only men and women can pour a cappuccino. Lord knows that I can't. But only men and women can carve marble statues. This is part of what you were made to do. You wanna know how noble it is to be an image bearer? Well, God has deposited in you the ability to represent and image him 
as a worker. Whenever we create something new, we are imitating God's creativity. God's will is that you and I would imitate God's skill, his strength, his intelligence. Turn with me to Genesis 4 for just a moment. Um, Look at verse 20. I think this is just cool. I don't know when you've ever heard this. Verse 20 of Genesis 4. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. I mean, those are cruel parents. Hey, Jabal, Jubal, come here. Um, His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. So here's how God made people. He made people in such a way where there would be such diversity and even the interest that they find that here is Jubal and Jabal. They're born to the same parents and one is the father, it says, of all those who would dwell in tents and own livestock. The first John Wayne right here. What's his brother? Is he like equally the man? I don't know. He's the father of all those who play the pipe. You know, so you got two opposites. Both here are imitating who God is. Go and run these livestock, get some cattle, great. And there's this other guy who's boop, 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 boop. You got the ultimate man and then um, another type of man, you know, right over here. I like, I like music. The curiosity that spawns the creation of a new instrument carved from the wood of a tree. You know how they used to make stringed instruments? Well, they would take it and carve it from wood and then the strings that themselves were made from animal gut. And they figured out that when they were disemboweling animals, you could actually turn those into strings. And this type of creativity, this level of curiosity, you know what God says about that? I love it. I love it because they're imitating me when they create whether that is from paper, from a tree, or laptop screens made from sand, we are imitating God's creativity. He creates out of nothing. We create out of the raw materials that he has given to us. In work, we show the wonder of God. This is why you are made. When the baker bakes, or when there is a medicinal discovery, or when you're preparing your company for an IPO, we can reflect God. It's a way for us to represent him. Animals can do some work. There, I've seen videos of dogs grabbing snacks from fridges. I mean, I'm not against that. Animals can plow and oxen can do things. But a beaver can build a dam, but a beaver cannot make an iPhone. You were made in a unique way to represent your God. Work gives us the privilege of creating value. Now, when Sally makes a t-shirt for three dollars. Is anybody named Sally in here? Okay, I'm safe. Okay, when Sally makes a shirt for three dollars and sells it for fourteen dollars, what just happened? She just added eleven dollars of value to the world that didn't exist before she worked. This is a uniquely human thing. God has made you to work and he tells you to work and this alone provides what you do with a level of dignity. Whether you're a surgeon or a server at a restaurant, your work is inherently good as long as it's not sinful and noble and the Lord tells you to do it. Furthermore, work is a way that God designed that you would be able to love your neighbor. When the farmer grows, when the baker bakes, when the builder builds, when the transporter transports, when the sales guy sells, God is providing for you and consequently loving you through other people's work. Martin Luther, who had much to say on the topic of work, helps us understand. He says that whenever there is good order, good city planning, when you marry and bear children, that is God in disguise. When you dig a ditch, when you write a play, you are God working. Meaning that God is working in this world through people that are diligent and understand the high calling and high value of work. Now the question is, why didn't God create the world in such a way where Adam and Eve wouldn't have to work in order to survive? Why didn't he just enable them initially in the garden to just fruit, fruit, I do whatever I want? Why did he make them to work? Well, I want you to imagine a scenario with me. 
Um, my dad didn't really ever take me camping, but I'll use camping as an illustration here. Now let's say I have a son one day, Abraham Isaac Jacob Artavanis. He's going to be a baller. Now, let's say I take Abraham Isaac Jacob Artavanis. I go on a camping trip with him. I need to start a fire. I'm going to need some help there. But I say, all right, let, go gather some wood for me, Abraham. All right? What I, I'm telling him, go gather. Go gather some sticks, anything you can find. Now, why do I want to do this with my son? Well, first of all, it's because I want him to survive, right? Right? I don't want him to be cold. But second of all, it's because I want my son to be what? Involved in what I'm doing. That brings me joy as a father when I don't just blindly provide everything he needs, but I allow him to enter into what I'm doing. This makes it a family business. And this gives joy to the son, but even more joy to the father. Does your work matter to God? Absolutely. William Tyndale says, if we look externally, there is a difference between washing dishes and preaching the word of God. But in regards to pleasing God, there is no difference at all. Ladies, if one day you're a mom and you change diapers and you make food and you clean dishes and you raise children, men, one day if you preach the Bible or sell a company, Not one of those occupations is more honoring to God than the other, so long as your heart is right before him. So the works designer, works design. Look with me at Genesis 3. I want to look at works distortion. I'm pulling a hairy here. I'm trying to go with alliteration. Okay. Works distortion. In Genesis 3, there's the fall, right? They sin. And then look at 3... 14 with me. It says, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now watch this. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your, cha- your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, as we've covered, the fall did not introduce work. But what did it do? It changed work's nature. We often think of work itself as a curse. I hear people say this to me all the time. Ah, Johnny, it's another day. I just can't wait to be in glory. Well, hey, buddy, I hope you know that in glory, you'll be working. I see these you know, video sometimes that it's just people singing. This is what we'll be doing for all of eternity. No, you won't just be singing. We will have responsibilities in the new heavens and the new earth. Work is not a curse. Mankind was workers before the fall. They will be workers in the new heavens and the new earth. But now, since man has been driven east of Eden and consequently no longer in the direct presence of God, we don't enjoy all of the blessings that come from God in that state in regards to our work, and now work is done by the sweat of our brow, it says. There is now a difficulty for God's people to work in God's world. This curse will not be lifted, and we will work in a world that abounds with thorns and thistles the rest of our life. There will be speed bumps. There will be challenges. And now thrown into the workplace is a level of difficulty In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, God frustrates what he had created us to do. Are children a byproduct of the fall? What's the answer? No, but what did it do? It says, in pain, you will bear children. Was there always the plan for babies? Yeah. Is work a byproduct of the fall? No, it changed its nature. 
the world is not going to cooperate with us anymore. And our bodies are not going to cooperate with us anymore. That's why Romans 8 says that creation was subjected to futility. And all of creation now pushes back because there is a level of difficulty. Which makes work hard. Number four, and this is where I want to spend the majority of the remainder of our time. I want to look at work's new dimension. Work's new dimension. The question is, how do we bring God glory now in our work? How do we work in a post-fall and post-curse environment? This is, by the way, a question that matters immensely. Whether you are a businessman or a housewife, you will stand before God and give an account of how well you stewarded your work life. The reformers used to say that inscribed upon every tool, inscribed upon every instrument, inscribed upon every single pen, there should be written a slogan, God delights in work. And what the world considers to be a curse, the Christian considers to be a blessing from God. Therefore, we rejoice in it. So back to our question, how do we work now in a way that brings God glory in a post-curse, post-fall environment? Well, when you claim to be a Christian and deliver poor quality work laced with grumbling and complaining, you make the gospel look bad. Can we really say that our hearts belong wholly to God when we offer to God and to those we work for subpar work 40 hours a week? You cannot live a mature Christian life and be a lazy person. You can be a Christian and be lazy, but you cannot be a mature, godly Christian and be lazy. Your faith doesn't have nothing to do with work. Your faith has everything to do with how you work. And you need to learn this now because the older you get, you implement systems and habits that are going to be harder and harder to break when you are older. If you think, yeah, I'll learn how to work when money's on the line. You better wake up. The greatest gift a father and a mother can give their children outside of the fear of the Lord is a diligent work ethic. Work is more also than just a place to win people to Christ. You are to be a salt and a light in the workplace, but work itself and labor itself is God-honoring. And if you're not the best worker in the field that you go into, you damage the credibility of the gospel. Work presents wonderful opportunities for you to share Christ. But it's more than just that. God is honored by the work itself. People pray for mission trips. People pray before they preach. People pray before they go to seminary. But very few people pray for the man on his way to work today. God, be honored as this man sells life insurance. But God wants you to see your work that way. It's not menial to God. It's not a matter of indifference to God. Your work matters to God. Colossians 1.18 says that Christ deserves and demands preeminence in everything. Therefore, every job except for deliberately sinful ones or ones that cause you to sin and stumble are dignifying and honoring to God. Now, under this banner of work's new dimension, I want to look at four brief elements of how the Christian is to work. Four brief elements of how the Christian is to work in a post-fall, post-curse environment. You ready? Number one, we are to glorify God by working with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. I meet too many people that might work hard, but work with an Eeyore perspective on life. You are to work with enthusiasm. Colossians 3.23, write down these references and imprint them on the tablet of your heart because this matters to God. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Meaning that God wants you to work in such a way, not just where you're begrudgingly going through the motions, but where you go, this matters to God and I will give him my everything. Romans 12, Paul says in 12, 11, do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Everything you do is under 
God's gaze. So work hard. It is natural to be enthusiastic about your work when it is in the center of attention or in the spotlight. But it's much more difficult to be enthusiastic about your work when it is hidden from the public eye. As the conductor of a great symphony orchestra was once asked, he was asked, what is the most difficult instrument to play in the orchestra? You know what he said? Second violin. He says, we get plenty of first violinists. But to get someone who will play second violin out of the spotlight with enthusiasm, that is a problem. Do you work at the cafeteria? Do you bust tables at a restaurant? The Bible says you need to work with enthusiasm. It doesn't have to be your forever job to honor God by working with enthusiasm in the here and now. Stop pacifying a lack of enthusiasm in your work by saying this is just for now. Because the habits that you set up now are the ones that you will have in five years. Because this has to do with a biblical conviction and not whether or not this is what you'll be doing for the next 40 years. So you work with enthusiasm. I want to do that, don't you? I want to work heartily as unto the Lord because work matters to God. Secondly, we glorify God by working with enjoyment. We enjoy what we do. Now, Solomon Ecclesiastes is the guy that starts off, hey Solomon, you're the richest guy in the world. Tell us what you think about life. Everything is meaningless. You know, it's like, whoa. But then he moves on from there and then he begins to talk about work a lot. In Ecclesiastes 2, he says, find enjoyment in your toil. This is from the hand of God. Ecclesiastes 5, 18, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all of one's labor in which he toils under the sun. Enjoy work, enjoy work. Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your what? Your might. For there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. With this positive viewpoint on work, work is seen as part of God's purpose and as part of God's fulfillment for your life because work should be enjoyable. You should enjoy it. And you should strive to be those who work with a happy, cheerful, and diligent heart. Now, the scripture speaks to the average man. Meaning that when the Bible speaks about work, it speaks to the blacksmith, it speaks to the farmer, it speaks to the housewife. Do all of them enjoy what they do? I don't know. What's the most mundane job you've ever had? Talk to me. Anybody? What? Stacking chairs for chapel. Stacking chairs for chapel. <laughs> okay. Amen. Now... Let's take that job, stacking chairs for chapel. How on earth, right, does someone possibly enjoy what they do? Do you know the answer of the scripture? Because Solomon is going to get to the answer in Ecclesiastes, and he's going to say, when all is said and done, the conclusion is fear God and what? Keep his commandments. The key that unlocks the door of fulfillment in an otherwise mundane job is the fear of the Lord. Because when you fear God, you understand that everything in your life is a gift from God and should be stewarded for the honor of God. And thereby, you can know that even work that doesn't necessarily on the surface be lively to you is honoring to God. And because you know this brings God glory, it can bring me joy. If you want to enjoy what you do and don't enjoy what you do, we grow in our fear of the Lord. Because we know that even as we work in some way, when we serve other people, when we do responsibilities like stacking chairs, we are representing the God who made us in his image and we are serving and loving our neighbor by meeting needs. Every single one of you are right now seated in a chair, right? So who said the stacking of the chairs? Who is it? Herbert, my singer. Now, (laughs) what Herbert might not understand right now is that this morning, or last night, or after chapel only, last night, 
When Herbert was setting up the chairs for chapel this morning, he not only was honoring God, but he was loving you. Because you're sitting in a chair, you're sitting in a chair, this is what brings us joy. And this is what brings God glory. Understand? Okay. Now, moving on. We third here, we glorify God when we work with excellence. We, wor- we glorify God when we work with excellence. Work that is truly Christian is work that is well done. Genesis 1 describes God's commitment to excellence when it describes how God responds to his creation. What does he say? Everything was what? Average? No, everything is awesome. It's amazing. It's very, very good. And the Christian is committed to good work. I worked in a restaurant all of high school and all of college and I loved it. But the reason I got the job at this specific restaurant is because when I was looking for a job, there was a restaurant that had my older brother and my older sister already working there. They found out that there were more in the quiver of Art of Anises and they recruited me over there to just be my brother's servant. And I just bossed me around. It was horrible. No, it was fine. Now, when I got there, I asked him, I said, I never even interviewed for this job. And they just said, we've seen how your brother and sister work. So this was clear. That's not a pat on our back. It's a, maybe more of an affirmation of the environment that we grew up in. My dad taught us to work. Christians ought to be the best workers wherever they are. They ought to have the best attitude. They ought to have the most integrity and the greatest degree of dependability. Sadly, there is little difference statistically in the work ethic of Christians and unbelievers. And if this is true, there is much cause for alarm. I know Christian business owners, just understand this, I want you to listen to this. I know Christian business owners that steer clear of hiring other Christians because they waltz in less motivated and less dependable than someone that doesn't even know God. They are more entitled. And this is a massive contradiction with how our faith should operate in our lives. When you present sloppy work to your boss, you present sloppy work to your God. Not that your boss is your God, but that your work matters to God. For Christians to not work with excellence, there is a sign that our lives are immensely spiritually dysfunctional. Why? Well, because you cannot present 80,000 or 100,000 of your hours to subpar excellence, knowing that God has given you a dignified responsibility and not endure immense spiritual trauma in the process. Girls, are you looking for a man to marry? Yes. (laughs) Well, don't marry a lazy one. Guys, are you looking for a woman to marry? No. That's okay. They already knew that. Now, I know you are. I know you are. Now, I mean, that was like emphatic, no. I mean, (laughs) girls, don't even talk to them, yeah. I hate women. Um, Now, girls, are you looking for a guy to marry? Guys, are you looking for a woman to marry? Don't marry a lazy one. And not only don't marry uh, someone who isn't lazy, marry a hard worker. I uh, haven't been married for too long, almost four years. And let me just tell you, I'm so glad I married a hard worker. Life is hard. Ministry is full. Babies aren't always easy. Marry someone with a high biblical worldview of work. Is your job difficult? Does it seem menial? Is it the same thing day after day? Well, the Lord tells you to do your work with excellence. Have you been passed over? 
and not received a reward or recognition, well then you can look forward to the day when one day you'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant from the Lord of all creation. Now, fourth and finally here, we glorify God by working with integrity. Turn with me to Ephesians 6 for a moment. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I swallowed a locust. Um, Ephesians 6. In verse 5. Slaves... Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. The impetus for working with excellence is when we understand that all of our work is before the eyes of God. Look at Paul just said. He said in verse 6, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. This assumes that in your life there will always be a lingering temptation to work for the wrong reasons and to please the wrong people. You'll have a lingering temptation to work for lesser motives than the Christian has. The believer works as if God's eye is always upon them because God is always watching, not just generally speaking, but specifically speaking in your life. God knows every hair on your head. He knows the nook and cranny of your hidden heart. And he knows every single time we just go through the motions with our work. Working with integrity means that you don't spend all day on Facebook or playing Candy Crush. And then when your boss rolls around, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, Bob. Okay, buy it. Okay, cool. Yeah, deal. You know, it's like, wait a second. No, that would be a lie to your boss But that is dishonoring to God. Your boss may be fooled by the appearance of hard work when he's watching, but God is not. Christians do not do the bare minimum, ever. They work with excellence. Working as unto the Lord means that God not only expects you to work hard, but he expects you to have an excellent attitude while you do it. My dad used to tell me all the time when I was a kid, Johnny, attitude is everything. Because my dad would have me work. Every Saturday morning it was understood. I mean, still I'm, I'm growing in this a little bit, but it's beyond me. You know, like I was, I, I was talking to someone the other day. I asked him, hey, who does your yard? It looks good. And he says, what do you mean who does my yard? My sons. They do my yard. They work. And I was just thankful for it because too often I think children are pandered to. They're not taught how to work. And not only are they not taught to work, they're not taught how to work well because they're not instructed that attitude is everything. You can dominate your work environment, but you can work with a chip on your shoulder. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. But love and joy are not antonyms with hard work. That is the way the Christian is to be identified. Paul here also is not writing to CEOs and corner offices. He's writing to slaves who do not enjoy what they do. And yet the instruction of Scripture is the same The second way you can be a man pleaser instead of a God pleaser is when you work to be noticed by men rather than to be honoring to God. Here's what you need to understand fundamentally is that every boss, every manager, and every supervisor in your life is ultimately middle management. Your work is done before the king and boss of the universe. 
And so our ultimate aim is not just to please our supervisor. And being employee of the month is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I hope every single environment you work in, they look at you and go, something is different. But your ultimate aim is to please the God who made you and who is honored by your work. Your work matters to God. Your attitude while you work matters to God. Your drive for excellence matters to God. Do you want to be a doctor? Be the best doctor. You want to go into business? Be the best businessman. You want to be a lawyer? Be an awesome lawyer. Musician? Be the best. Not for man, but for God. God is a worker, so those who are his creatures must have an elevated view of work. Now the question as we close is what about rest, right? What about Sabbath? It's a worthy subject, right? Because God worked for six days and then he, what, on the seventh? He, he rested. Rest is necessary for our own spiritual health. It's a good and biblical thing to slow down and honor God, to contemplate who he is, to spend it with one another. But you need to understand something. You do not work so you can rest. You rest so that you can work. The Christian is not living for the weekend. They are resting for the work week. Because God is honored in work. Can I pray for you? God, we're thankful, Lord, that the Bible gives us everything we need pertaining to a life of godliness. Lord, I I pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, would preach a stronger and clearer sermon than I could. But Lord, I pray that the aim of this message is helpful, and that is to elevate our biblical understanding of work. Rest is indeed a necessary subject. Many people find themselves in opposite gutters, one of workaholism and the other of laziness. But I pray that, Lord we would find ourselves on an inaccurate obedience to working in your world in a God-honoring way. Lord, I pray that as we work, we would be a salt and a light to those around us. But Lord, I pray that right now we would do our work with enthusiasm, with enjoyment, with excellence, and with integrity for your glory and for your honor. We pray this in your name and all God's people said.